I want to thank Eric for inviting me to give this talk about uh, Stroke Update 2019. Here are my disclosures. I am uh, participating in multiple NIH uh, and industry-funded stroke trials, but I don't get paid. Um, and what is the current state of stroke in the United States? So every year, according to the CDC, there's about 800,000 strokes occurring, uh, with the majority of these strokes the first time for our patients. 87% of the strokes are ischemic strokes, a uh, much smaller number in the hemorrhagic strokes. And stroke kills 140,000 Americans each year, uh, leading to these very sobering statistics that an American is having a stroke every 40 seconds and dying of a stroke every four minutes. It's also very, very costly. It costs about $34 billion a year in the United States. And this includes medical treatments, healthcare services, and missed days of work. And stroke is a leading cause of serious long-term disability. It reduces mobility in more than half the stroke survivors age 65 and above. And looking at this heat map of stroke death rates from the most recent database from the NIH, um, the purple, dark purple area are areas of highest uh, stroke death rates. And so you can see that there's the stroke, stroke belt where Lily and John escaped from, um, affecting uh, the Midwest and the, the South of the United States. Uh, Seattle is up here, so we have a much lighter purple area of stroke death rates, but you can see that our neighbors in Alaska and Hawaii do have pretty high uh, stroke death rate. So um, I'm going to cover ground in the pre-hospital setting, the hospital setting, uh, talk about secondary stroke prevention, and then the outpatient world. And I'm probably going to spend half on the pre-hospital hospital setting, and then uh, the other half in the secondary and clinic setting. And I'm going to use these abbreviations. Uh, what I want to point out is for Alteplase, I will be using TPA. Um, and then I'm going to be using these Swedish-specific definitions. So code stroke, we activate a code stroke when we think a patient's having an acute stroke and they are a TPA candidate. And then code IR um, is a potential thrombectomy candidate. So I'll start with a case. A 65-year-old woman found down with right hemiparesis and gaze deviation. And on EMS evaluation, they noted she had airway compromise. Her last known well was 930, and she was fast positive. So specifically, she had an asymmetric smile, she had arm weakness on one side, and she had the speech change. Now, EMS also calculated her LAMS, or Los Angeles Motor Scale, and they scored it as a four. And so I'm going to take a little turn here and talk about how we identify large vessel occlusions in Washington State. And we do it by EMS triage. So every uh, EMS provider in Washington State gets specific training on identifying large vessel occlusion. And this is their current protocol. Step one, is the patient having a stroke? Next step is, is it fast positive? And if the patient has fast positive, then they will go on to calculate the stroke severity score using LAMS. So LAMS stands for the Los Angeles Motor Scale, and that's shown here. Uh, you get a point if you have a facial droop. You get a point if you have arm drift. Two points if your arm falls rapidly. And then you get a point if you have weak grip strength. And then two points if you have a flaccid weakness. So the total maximum score is a five. And what the literature has shown is that a large vessel occlusion can be predicted if the LAMS is four or above. So that's really important because EMS is going to then determine the destination of the patient. So uh, based on last known well and the LAMS score, and if the LAMS is high, suggests that the patient could benefit from a large vessel uh, thrombectomy for a large vessel occlusion, so they will transport that patient to a comprehensive stroke center instead of a primary stroke center because a comprehensive stroke center is thrombectomy capable. So examples of comprehensive stroke centers would be the Swedish Cherry Hill Campus, Harborview Medical Center, Virginia Mason Medical Center, and examples of uh, primary stroke centers where there isn't thrombectomy available would be the Edmonds and First Hill campuses at Swedish, as well as Northwest Hospital. 
So going back to our patient, uh, let's go over the timeline of what happened. So at 11.02, 911 was called. Uh, we have great EMS uh, times here. So 11.10, EMS arrives, patient's fast positive, lands a spore, and they intubated the patient because they noted she had airway compromise. On the way to the emergency department, they notified the emergency department at Cherry Hill. And based on the LAM score of four, the code IR was activated from the field. So the team was ready when the patient arrived at Cherry Hill ED. There was a safety pause, and the patient was taken directly to the CT scanner, where the neurologist then read and reviewed the head CT and made a decision to give TPA at 1229. The patient was then taken to the IR suite, where there was um, initial reperfusion, final reperfusion, and finally, the patient was admitted to the neurocritical care unit. So I also want to just point out that this whole timeline involves multiple team members uh, taking care of the patient from EMS to emergency medicine to nursing to uh, radiology, neurology, uh, interventional uh, re radiology, and then neurocritical care. And I didn't even talk about the outpatient. So it's really a multidisciplinary uh, team approach, and I want to thank my colleagues for being such a great team members, because uh, the door to needle time for this patient was excellent, 31 minutes, and the door to growing time was also excellent, 42 minutes. And how did the patient do? So here is the um, initial angiogram, which showed a complete occlusion of the left internal carotid artery and middle cerebral artery. And uh, the final uh, IR sh uh, shot shows uh, complete recanalization of the ICA and MCA with a perfect score of reperfusion, PICI-3. More importantly, clinically, uh, two months after her stroke, the patient was actually living independently. She had some slight disability with speech and motor apraxia, but she's actually doing very well. So let's go over our acute stroke algorithm that we use. So patient uh, presents with an acute ischemic stroke Stroke team is activated, and the patient should be taken immediately for a stat non-contrast head CT. Importantly, if there isn't a hemorrhage, and the patient's sym uh, symptoms are stable, very mild, non-disabling, they may not get TPA, but they should be admitted for a stroke workup. And a stroke workup should include urgent uh, vessel imaging, such as a CT angiogram. On the other hand, if there's a large hypodensity on head CT, suggesting that the patient already has a well-established stroke. They're also not a TPA candidate, and so these patients uh, should also be admitted for a stroke workup. And then for, like, our patient, uh, she presented within the uh, four-and-a-half-hour uh, time window, so she's a TPA candidate. So the neurologist made a decision to give her TPA, uh, and concurrently, she actually went for a CT angiogram, and uh, there was a large vessel occlusion, so the decision was made for her to go for endothast go to therapy, from that to me. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move on to a, a, a different case. A 50-year-old man has stroke risk factors of high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, and tobacco use, and he was found by his wife in the morning at 9 o'clock, knocking around into things, noted to have right-sided weakness and speech problems, it was aphasia, and she knew that his last known well was nine hours before, when he went to bed at midnight. So she called 911, EMS noted that the patient was fast positive, and this time the patient had a, a LAMS of five, again suggesting the patient has a large vessel occlusion. So uh, here's the timeline. 911, wife calls 911, and then EMS arrives. And uh, en route, they actually pre notified the emergency department. This was at Edmonds. Um, and uh, they did a safety pause, and the patient uh, went for a code stroke, had a CT scan. And the CT scan showed these imaging findings. So, what do you see here? This is the uh, audience participation part of the. You can feel free to just shout out answers. Uh, 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 someone said dense MCA. 
I want to note that I don't see hemorrhage, which is good, right? We're not seeing hemorrhage here. But yes, there is a dense MCA sign here. And I also want to just point out maybe, I, I don't know if you can see, like with, with the window in here, you might see that there's maybe some subtle hypodensity in the uh, internal capsule here on the left. Um, and maybe even here, deeper white matter. Looks like my mouse doesn't show up on the screen. Um, this is the patient's um, angiogram, uh, sorry, CT angiogram. What you can see is that there's a very quick um, stoppage of uh, contrast in the internal capsule. So it just doesn't flow. So um, we would call this a wake-up stroke, right? The patient woke up with symptoms. So what would you do next? Any ideas? Silence. He's outside the window with TPA. Yes, so no TPA. So I, I actually put these choices. We can all vote on them. Anyone? Someone says no on TPA, so we can cross out A. Anyone want to do anything else? MRI. MRI, okay. Consider a thrombectomy. Consider a thrombectomy. See some nods. Okay. Well, um, I can tell you what happened. So the uh, patient um, had an NIH stroke scale of 17, so that's a severe stroke. Code IR was activated. The patient was transferred out to Cherry Hill downtown, um, where an, our stroke team met the patient. Uh, a score of the NIH stroke scale on arrival at Cherry Hill had worsened by that time uh, to 21. And then they went for thrombectomy, and it was admitted to the neurocritical care unit. And uh, similar to uh, patient number one, complete occlusion of the left ICA and MCA um, with very good recanalization. And we'll talk about this patient in a little bit in the um, hospital and outpatient setting, so I won't talk about the MRI, although you want an MRI. We'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so this is a patient who doesn't fall into the TPA time window. But uh, last known well was somewhere between four and a half to 24 hours with disabling stroke symptoms. So these patients actually should be considered for IR. And uh, if they are found to have a large vessel occlusion, they should be uh, um, considered for endovascular therapy. And this is really borne out by two uh, thrombectomy trials published in 2018, the DAWN trial and the Diffuse 3 trial, as highlighted here, is published in January 2018 in New England Journal. And here's the take home. So patients with an acute severe stroke benefited from the thrombectomy beyond six hours, last known well, if number one, their head CT didn't show a large stroke, they had a large vessel occlusion, these trials looked at the ICA and MCA, and then they had a high NH stroke scale. So they took people beyond NIH show scale six in diffuse three and beyond 10 in dawn. Um, so based on these trials, the emergent thrombectomy treatment window has been out to 24 hours. And these two trials actually showed the number needed to treat was excellent. I also wanna just talk about how they chose these patients because we know that um, thrombectomy isn't appropriate for everyone. And what I want to talk about is uh, patients with a wake-up stroke who go for thrombectomy actually have good collaterals. And how can you detect that? So you can do that, see that with perfusion imaging. So um, I'll, I'll explain. This is someone's perfusion imaging. So this is a 59-year-old man. He had a wake-up stroke. He presented 13 hours after last known well. His NIH stroke scale was high. It was 23. And this is the CT perfusion imaging. And so the left-hand side, I call it the purple side, um, shows the ischemic core. So this is the area of stroke that's already happened. It's irreversibly damaged. So that's a very small volume. You can see it says 23 mils. Then on the right-hand side, I call it the green side. The green side is the perfusion deficit or perfusion lesion. And so this is the area where the blood flow is delayed and it potentially could be reversed if, there's thrombe uh, if you do a thrombectomy. So really, a, a patient who would benefit thrombectomy would have a small purple, so the stroke is, it's established is very small, um, and then there's a large area that could stroke out if you, if you don't do anything, so that's the green part. And you can actually measure that with a mismatch of green to purple, 
And the, for this patient, the mismatch ratio was 5.6. So I want to contrast that to a patient that we actually considered thrombectomy on, but we didn't take to thrombectomy because this patient uh, had a much higher purple side. You can see that the, the mils here are 118 mils, and the ratio between green and the purple isn't that great. So here are some numbers to think about. If you're thinking about thrombectomy, um, we've kind of had this programmed into our brain now or onto our iPhone. Uh, the ischemic core, the purple side, should be small, less than 70 mils. The lesion on the green side should be big. And then the mismatch ratio should be greater than 1.8. And these are some of the criteria we use to help decide if a patient is a thrombectomy candidate. And the reason why I'm reviewing, uh, reviewing this with you is because we're using this to make decisions to make thromb, uh, to, for the thrombectomy clinically, but it's also being used in the hyperacute stroke trials. So it was not just DAWN and Diffuse 3, but also in tenecteplase. So I'll change, uh, talk about tenecteplase. It's a modified form of ultiplase. You may know it as TNK. Um, and um, there's some confusion. Sometimes people call it TPA, because technically it is ultiplase. Um, it is more fibrin specific, it has a longer half-life, and it's very convenient because you can give it in one single bolus instead of ultiplase where you have to give a bolus and then infuse it over an hour. Um, it's already approved for acute coronary syndrome, so a lot of hospitals actually have this already uh, in, in, in the pharmacy. And the important thing is that it's half the price of ultiplase, and so some places like Nepal, uh, they're using tenecteplase for acute stroke because they have more resource limited uh, in a setting. So how does tenecteplase perform compared to ultiplase, or what we call TPA? Uh, so this was a randomized trial published in 2018 in which they randomized 202 patients in Australia and New Zealand to either tenecteplase or ultiplase. And all these patients were having acute stroke and they wanted to look at how does uh, tenecteplase perform. Um, the primary outcome is reperfusion of the greater than 50% of the uh, involved vascular territory or absence of thrombus. And, well, it did very well. Uh, so tenecteplase versus ultiplase, it had higher rates of reperfusion and recanalization. And this was uh, statistically significant with a p-value of 0.002. And, and, and interestingly, there were improved clinical outcomes at 90 days post-stroke, also statistically significant. And uh, importantly, it had a good safety profile. The symptomatic uh, intracerebral hemorrhage in both groups was very similar and very low. So I want to draw your attention to an ongoing trial called the TIMELESS trial. Uh, looking at tenecteplase in the extended uh, time window, they're randomizing patients to tenecteplase versus a placebo and then they're choosing patients based on perfusion uh, whether uh, these will be randomized uh, in the time window. So sort of like similar to a thrombectomy trial. Um, and these patients will have an IC or MCA vessel occlusion and then we'll look at uh, patient function at 90 days post-stroke. So more on that later. Um, any questions? I'm gonna move into the outpatient world now a little bit. Sorry, okay. hospital world. Yeah, um, so I've sat in on some of these. There, there's like a, a stent, and then these are much safer now, and then there's a retrieval with aspiration. Um, it's kind of from a non-interventionalist point of view is what we see. I don't know if anyone is doing. I will say the new devices are much better than the old devices. So uh, moving on to the hospital setting, I want to talk about transient ischemic attack, TIA. Uh, traditionally, it's, it's been thought to be transient neurological symptoms, less than 24 hours, felt to be due to a cerebral ischemic event. But maybe a more modern definition uh, would be transient neurological symptoms, including eye, retinal ischemia, uh, and more importantly, no cerebral infarction on imaging. Because um, we know that even patients with neurological symptoms that we think are TIA, only several minutes, about 30% of patients will actually have an infarct on brain imaging if you, if you do their brain imaging. So it's a clinical diagnosis. We do brain imaging expecting that there won't be a stroke. 
And I want to just point out that if a stroke is seen on brain MRI, then the, the, the formal diagnosis of a stroke, even if the patient clinically sounds like they're having a TIA. Um, and then why do we worry about TIA? Well, there was a meta-analysis going back uh, from 2007 showing that TIA actually, there's a high risk of stroke after TIA, 3.5% uh, in the next two days after TIA, 8% 30 days after. Um, and then my former professor at UCSF, Clay Johnston, and, and his colleagues actually used uh, this ABCD2 score system to look at stroke risk after TIA. So I'll go through it. Um, a is for age. You get a point if you're over 60 years old. B is for blood pressure. You get a point if your systolic blood pressure is over 140 or your diastolic is over 90. C is for unilateral weakness. You get two points. And then if you have speech changes only, it's one point. D is for duration. And then the second D is for diabetes. And so the total score would be a maximum of seven points. And what this publication from Lancet 2007 looked at is uh, the stroke risk based on your ABCD2 score. So you have a TIA, you get your ABCD2 score. And what you can see here is that importantly, if you have an ABCD2 score of four or a five, your two-day stroke risk is 4%. Uh, and if it's even higher, if your ABCD2 score is six or seven. So this actually ch led to a change in management of TIA patients. Um, traditionally at Swedish, we admit all our TIA patients, or uh, some other places do a rapid outpatient evaluation, knowing that there's a risk for a stroke in the next 48 hours. And um, when we, ha when we uh, look at, when we admit our TIA patients, this is the test that we do. We do vessel imaging, brain MRI, make sure they don't have a stroke lipid profile, transthoracic echocardiogram. They also have cardiac monitoring while they're on the, the nursing floor. Uh, they get repeat uh, neurological exams, make sure that they're not worsening. And really, there's a lot of advantages to inpatient monitoring. You get rapid access to your testing and treatment. The nurses can, can de uh, clinically detect if a patient is worsening on the floor, and potentially this patient could get TPA. Um, and, and there's no need for authorization for tests. However, there are some disadvantages. Um, TIA is considered an observation status, and it's not covered by Medicare Part A. So I've had some patients come to my clinic complaining about their bill. And um, we know at Cherry Hill that we're often running at very high, high census. So uh, admitting a patient for a TIA can result in capacity issues. So um, I want to tip my hat to Sheila Smith, our former fearless uh, stroke medical director, who had the vision to put together a plan for a TIA clinic at Swedish Cherry Hill. Uh, we don't have an oper operationalizing start date yet, but uh, hopefully by the end of 2019, we'll be having a TIA clinic. And I want to talk to you about the proposed protocol uh, for patients who present to the ED with a TIA the initial evaluation should include a brain MRI, vessel imaging, ABCD2 score. Um, and if the patient has a low ABCD2 score, they don't have an acute stroke on their brain MRI, they don't have significant vessel stenosis on CT angiogram or other vessel imaging, there's no other stuttering symptoms, AFib, uh, no other indication for hospital admission, these patients can then be referred to the TIA stroke clinic. And uh, Jill Nelson, Lily Henson are here. Uh, they'll be helping to staff the stroke uh, TIA clinic. So moving on to secondary stroke prevention. Uh, really, this is key to, to preventing strokes uh, from a risk factor perspective. These are the major risk factors that I we discussed as a team in the neural hospice team. And then again, reiterated in the stroke clinic. Um, blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, dyslipidemia, physical uh, inactivity. Um, AFib uh, is another important stroke um, uh, risk factor and carotid artery stenosis. Um, I want to draw your attention to the 2017 guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and AHA, which did note that an elevated blood pressure is systolic greater than 120 over 80. So um, 
the guidelines are much more stringent now with respect to hypertension. There are many non-pharmacologic interventions that we discuss with our patients, such as losing weight, DASH diet, reducing sodium, increasing physical activity, and uh, limiting alcohol intake. And one uh, other thing to, to, to talk about is that hypercholesterol itself is not a strong risk factor, but we do treat patients with HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, uh, uh, aka the statins, because they do d decrease the risk of strokes. And I will say, uh, I have a lot of patients in the Pacific Northwest who read a lot of stuff online, and they, they're not enthused about starting statins. So I kind of have this talk about how statins have these other um, helpful um, roles in plaque stabilization, reducing inflammation, uh, slowing carotid arterial disease progression, improving endothelial function, uh, and reducing uh, embolic stroke. And we kind of talk about how stats can help uh, in different ways, not just cholesterol. And we do know that lipid lowering by other means, such as fibrates, resins, and diets, they actually don't have a significant impact on stroke incidence. Um, and now I'll move to the clinic side, and I'll, I'll go back to patient number two. As, as you will remember, he's the wake-up stroke, 50 years old. Uh, these are his stroke risk, risk factors. He had a complete occlusion of the left ICA and MCA, um, and, and John wanted a brain MRI. So here, here is his brain MRI. You can see that he did have residual stroke in the left caudate uh, body and nucleus, lentiform nucleus, and amygdala. Uh, while in the hospital, he did undergo telemetry monitoring that showed only normal sinus rhythm. He had a transcranial Doppler that didn't show any active emboli. And so uh, where would we put this patient with respect to stroke subtypes? So this is what we do in the neural hospital setting. We're like, why did this stroke happen? Well, it, clearly it wasn't a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, we didn't find um, significant atherosclerotic disease. Uh, the pattern of the stroke doesn't fall into the lacunar uh, category. Uh, maybe he has a cardiogenic embolism. I, I would give you that. Uh, but right now, we haven't actually found um, a cause for this stroke. So we would call him in, put him into the cryptogenic category. And about 26% of patients actually have cryptogenic stroke. And the literature actually suggests that a lot of these strokes seem embolic. And where are these emboli coming from? So it could be from a different vessel, such as the aorta or carotid, or it could be from the heart. And maybe this patient has undetected AFib, occult AFib. So in the hospital, he got his standard workup with EKG and telemetry. But um, in the, um, there has, we are starting to do much more uh, monitoring in the outpatient setting. So you can do a 24 to 48 uh, hour monitor, or you can use a small or ambulatory monitor. The, so the upper right-hand corner is what we use in the stroke clinic. And Tom Kushner, uh, my former stroke clinic colleague, used to talk about how the more you look, uh, the more you find. And I actually, the, the EMBRACE trial actually supports Tom's, um, Tom's uh, uh, very, uh, <laughs> his, his thought process. Because this trial randomized 572 patients with PIA or cryptogenic stroke to either a 30-day event trigger recorder, which is the intervention arm, or conventional 24-hour monitoring, a control arm. And uh, AFib was detected much more, uh, much more in the intervention arm. So 30 days of event monitoring, 16% of patients had AFib versus 3% in the control arm. So the number needed to screen was eight. However, I think that's not just the whole story because uh, the CRYSTAL AF trial um, showed uh, randomized people to uh, a, either a insertable cardiac monitoring versus conventional follow-up. And then they followed these patients out in time. So that's shown here. So the red line is the cardiac monitor, the insertable cardiac monitor patients, compared to the control arm where you just had conventional follow-up. And at 12 months, you can see that, yes, you just saw a bit much more uh, much more in the uh, cardiac monitor arm in the red line compared to the blue line. But if you draw a line all the way across at the end of 12 months, uh, only maybe 10 to 20% of patients actually had AFib found. 
And this suggests that maybe subclinical AFib is not explaining most of the cryptogenic strokes that we're seeing. So uh, we've come up with a new term, um, ESIS. You'll, you might hear these, this term being used. It's embolic stroke of unclear source. These patients don't have a lacuna stroke. They don't have large uh, vessel stenosis. There's no other cardiac source of embolism found. Can't find AFib. No other specific cause of stroke. So these are what we call ESIS patients. And what should we do with these patients? So you might be asking yourself, well, should we just anticoagulate these patients? It looks like an embolic stroke. It's coming from somewhere. Um, but I want to just point your attention that there's been two randomized double-blind controlled trials, navigate ESIS and respect ESIS. And both trials did not show um, that anticoagulating these patients were superior to aspirin alone. Uh, navigate ESIS was stopped in 2017 due to fertility. And then the RESPECT ESIS trials we've been waiting for got published in May 2019. And the Bigatran, the anticoagulant being used, was not superior to aspirin and preventing recurrent stroke. So um, there's now a hypothesis that atrial cardiopathy may be the cause of embolism in the absence of arrhythmia. And um, there are some markers of atrial cardiopathy uh, that you can see on EKG or, or an elevated pro-BNP um, and some findings on echocardiogram. And so there's an ongoing uh, Arcadia trial that's randomizing patients who have atrial cardiopathy to either apixaban versus aspirin. So back to patient number two, he did have a transthoracic echocardiogram that showed normal EF and normal valves, but he had a positive bubble study. Um, and he did undergo outpatient cardiac monitoring for 14 days, did, didn't show any AFib. Um, based on the positive bubble study, he went back to cardiology and he underwent a TEE where the PFO was uh, quoted as sizable inter atrial shunt. Um, lower extremity duplex didn't show um, a DVT. So what, what about this PFO? So this is something else that we uh, talk about um, in our stroke patients. So just as a reminder, a PFO is a small connection between the right and left sides of the heart, between the atria. And in young stroke patients, and I, I may be offending some people here, age, age uh, less than 60, um, with a PFO and no other alter, uh, alternate explanation for stroke, uh, this may be a source uh, for paradoxical uh, emboli. And PFOs can be detected by a TEE, TTE, or even a transcranial Doppler. And there's been a lot of uh, controversy about closing PFOs because there are a lot of negative trials published in the 2012-2013 era that didn't show benefit to closing PFO. But more recently, there's been other uh, trials that show a benefit to uh, PFO closure. And um, part of this was just who was being sent for PFO closure. So I want to draw your attention to this great editorial by Alan Roper, who's, who's just a great um, clinician, who pointed out in this editorial in the New England Journal the tipping point for Peyton Foreman O'Valley closure. He notes that the rates of stroke in the new trials of PFO closure were really, really low. So the procedure itself is, is, is not a high risk procedure. And he also talks about that there are some features on the PFO that you can see on TEE that would be considered high risk features. So this would be bubbles seen at rest, as well as uh, the atrial septal aneurysm flopping around more than 10 millimeters. And so I want to thank Tom for um, pointing this out, this article to me. So um, we also use the risk of paradoxical embolism or ROPE score to help identify patients who may benefit from PFO closure. And that's shown here. Uh, does the patient have other stroke risk factors? Really, um, they don't have any other stroke risk factors. It gives you a high ROPE score. Um, and then your age, if the younger you are, the higher, you, more points you get. So if we score our patient, he did have some stroke risk factors. He had high blood pressure and smoker. So he got zero points for those. Didn't have diabetes. He didn't have any previous stroke. 
cortical infarct at one point, and then he's age 50, so he gets two points. So his total rope score is five, suggesting that he has a 34 chance of, uh, that his stroke is due to the PFO. And Sheila did actually send him to uh, see our cardiologist to talk about PFO closure. So how I think about PFO closure is that if you have a young patient with embolic stroke, so ESIS patient, has a PFO and TEE with high-risk features, atrial septal aneurysm that's flopping around, also has a very thorough stroke workup, including a hypercoagulable workup, then it's time to think about PFO closure. So I have several minutes, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, in summary, I talked about stroke in the pre-hospital setting, the benefits of EMS triage, uh, LAMS of greater four or greater uh, predicts a large vessel occlusion. Um, in a hospital setting, the thrombectomy window has been extended out to 24 hours. The benefits of perfusion and helping you decide which patients would benefit from thrombectomy. Uh, Tenecteplase is on the horizon, it's being used now. Managing TIA uh, patients, excited about this TIA clinic. Secondary stroke uh, prevention is shown here. And then um, in the clinic, the benefits of extended cardiac monitoring and when to think about PFO closure. So I will stop there and take your questions. Oh, I do want to thank some people before I do that. I want to thank Sheila and Tom, my stroke clinic colleagues. Uh, I want to welcome our, my new colleagues in the audience, Jill Nelson. Hi, Jill. And Lily Henson, who's back. Uh, my colleagues at the neuro hospice team, our excellent stroke clinic team, Jordan, Jeff, uh, Becca, who keep it running like a well-oiled machine. And of course, our stroke team that crunches all the data and makes sure we do good quality work and keeps us certified as a comprehensive stroke center. So thank you. Yes, yes, hi. Yes, I think we do have some patients where um, we send for uh, left atrial appendage procedures, whether it's putting in a watchman device or something, um, because they can't be on anticoagulation. Those are folks that we consider. So yes, it's something to consider. Yes. Oh, that's already like a given. That's beyond. <laughs> it's beyond aspirin. Sorry. Yes. 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 Oh, hi. Oh, PFO can be seen on echocardiogram. So if you don't have it, if you suspect it in a young patient, in a TTE, so transthoracic echo is negative, we actually will send these patients for TEE, transesophageal echo, and we also have TCD PFO. So we actually, that's a more sensitive test than uh, the echo. So we have we have a luxury of testing procedures here, look for it. Yes? So uh, on the MRI in that second patient, so we're not doing ratios before we take people to... We are, yeah, yeah. Of that patient, you know? She, uh, the, which patient? The second patient. No, yeah, that one was pre-perfusion because the patient actually came from Edmonds. So it's a young patient. Edmonds doesn't have CT perfusion at the moment. It will be, hopefully by the end of this year, but based on age, and we just went uh, aspect score. So the old way would just use aspects. So aspects is just head CT imaging, and his aspects was really good, like maybe a nine. But then a patient with a large infarct on MR, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go there. Yeah, and that was our old protocol. We actually used to only use MRI, and it just blew a lot of time windows. So our old protocol was MRI. Mm. Yeah. I think we had the ICAST trial, too, at one point, it was an MRI. Yes. I, I just want to be real clear on this. As a, as a primary practice doc, you know, I get nasty grounds back from specialists if, oh. my, if my stroke victims are not coagulancing. So what I'm hearing is aspirin. If DOACs or um, uh, uh, warfarin or, or clopidogrel, you know, are not effective for secondary stroke. Yeah, um, I, I did talk about benefits of dual antiplatelet. That was last year's talk. I didn't want to keep repeating myself. Um, 
but there are benefits. So some people actually would benefit from dual antiplatelets, so aspirin with clopidogrel. So these would be people with lots of intracranial stenosis, or they, they are high risk uh, stroke patients, high risk TIA patients, where we haven't found AFib, then we would do dual antiplatelet, we would consider that. And then of course, we look really hard to, if we don't find AFib, we look really hard. We want to look for a reason to anticoagulate. So yeah. Question asked is, how long do you leave them on um, yeah, it's really, uh, uh, it depends. So some, some folks uh, in China, they talk about 90 days, that's the chance trial, and then the point trial, which was the chance trial in America and in the Western uh, world, uh, it, it, they did 21 days. So uh, maybe 21 days, to not, <clears throat> sorry, 90 days, depending on the reason. But eventually you go on to one. Yeah, yes, because there's a bleeding risk if it's dual antiplatelet forever. So, maybe I'll put that back into my talk for next year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So how, how much private sensitivity testing are you doing? Oh, uh, you know, here we, we, we test most everybody. Okay. Because there is a, maybe a 10% genetic, um, genetic, <coughs> genetic uh, inability to respond to, to clopidogrel. So yes. It's, it's been pretty expensive for a lot of Medicare patients that have paid for it. Is, uh, is Plavix expensive? It is, yeah. It has, oh. I thought it was Ticagrelor. Yeah, it's uh, 300 bucks a month. Mm. I do know we, we some people are Plavix non-responders, so then we put them on Ticagrelor, um, and that's very expensive. It's not covered by a lot of insurance, so it's challenging. Yeah. The Plavix blood test is, how, how do you order that? I mean, um, because there's a term for that. Yes, uh, here it's called a Plavix inhibition assay. Got it, got it. Uh, I think there's actually genetic testing maybe at Harborview. I think there's a, is anyone here from Harborview? I feel like there's a genetic test they do send for that. I think that's expensive too. Yeah, because in all, all the epics, it's all, it's all a different label. Yes, yes, all yes. yes. If, you, if you just uh, search Plavix, okay. it comes up. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you.